Well, wins 9, 10, and 11 come for the Cincinnati Reds against the Colorado Rockies. It was a series that was completely different from what these two teams experienced earlier on this season and last season as well. We're going to get into that. We're going to look at the most impressive performances from these three games at Great American Ballpark and what is next for the Reds and the Rockies here on this locked on crossover between locked on Reds and locked on Rockies. I am Jeff Carr. He is Paul oh, Holden. Man. Oh, I didn't know if you were tossing the ball. I, I, was, I was really <laughs> excited. I just wanted to do it. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I should have. Yeah, that was just me moving my hand. Sorry. Uh, he is Paul Holden, a host of Locked On Rockies. We uh, bring you your favorite Reds and Rockies content each and every day as part of the Locked On Podcast Network because we are your team every day. And thanks to all the everydayers that are out there. Um, I, I, I appreciate everyone in the comments section for, for both teams. Really, as we go through the season, it's a long season. And yes, an 11 game win streak is mighty impressive. But uh, we know that there's an ebb and a flow to the season. And just right now, the Reds seem to be caught in the flow. The Rockies in a little bit more of an ebb. We're going to get into uh, all of that here on today's episode that is brought to you by eBay Motors. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. So for parts that fit, head to eBay Motors and look for the green check. Stay in the game with eBay Guaranteed Fit. eBayMotors.com. Let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. And, Paul, where we want to apply this is... When it comes to the Reds and the Rockies, you and I did a podcast last season where we looked at both of these franchises and said, boy, they're in pretty similar spots. The, the Rockies had invested money in Chris Bryant. Uh, they still had a couple of key veterans that were leading the team. And the Reds, on the other hand, had just torn down everything and, and gotten a bunch of prospects. But now things have sort of flipped. And I would be totally disingenuous if I told you I expected it to happen this quickly. Yeah, that's the biggest thing I think is so impressive about the Reds is how quickly it has come together. And yes, it has been, like you said, it is is part. It's a great streak, and the Reds have a long way to go to still finish the season. But the Reds get to the benefit of a completely different thing. They're in a wide open race yes. when it comes to the division. <laughs> now, the tough part for them is the wild card's not much of an option for a team that might be, you know, uh, it's other teams in the NL West, for example. You're you're going to see multiple NL West teams in the playoffs this year. How many? That's really going to be a question. I mean, it, it might be a good chunk of them, but that's where the Reds get the benefit. But the other thing that the Reds did was they took it on the chin. Castillo, Suarez, they're gone. But for the Rockies, that's not the case. And we're sitting here. We don't have a guy that can cover 90 feet in eight and a half steps <laughs> or something like that. We don't have... A lot of we don't have a lot of truly young guys. We have young when it comes to service time guys uh, for the Rockies, but more. But they're the average age of the Colorado Rockies is still twenty nine. They're not a right. young team by by any stretch of the imagination. So the Reds kind of embrace taking on the chin. And, and I talked about this on my show today. I had choice words for I can't remember who said where you're going to go, but when your front office disrespects Phil. you like the yeah. Reds did, like the Reds front office did last year, I can relate to that because we've been getting fed the same line for, you know, nearly 30 years now at this point with, uh, with the Rockies, but they, they're not willing, at least for now to take it on the chin. You have to sell at this point. The Rockies have to look at, at the Reds and do what they did. And trade with teams like uh, like Seattle and trade with teams like Miami because the, the pitching depth isn't there. There's no top pro pitching prospects. You're hesitant to even play some of your top prospects. We talked a little bit in the pre-show about Montero. He is the guy from the Arenado trade, and he's struggling this year, certainly. But he's not being given the opportunity to work through it at the major league level because they dropped him down. What does he do? He dominates AAA. Montero is a is a, the AAA is not going to help him anymore. That's not what we're going to do. Right. So the biggest turn for these two teams has just been the Reds embracing rebuilding, embracing that terminology, because look at where the Reds, the Diamondbacks and the Orioles are this year. Mm -hmm. And look at where the Rockies are. That's true. It's, it's night and day. Now, 
I think the Reds still, you know, they got the Rockies had ample opportunities getting back into these games in this series. It's certainly uh, there wasn't, you know, the, the Rockies had moments, absolutely. But again, it's, it's deeper with the Rockies. It's not just the team on the field. It's the front office. It's the philosophy. It's the organization as it's, it, those are really the deep problems on top of the Rockies being one of the most hurt teams in baseball. I think those are the really the main storylines and differences between these two teams, especially from a year ago, because I agree with you, Jeff, if we are sitting here on June 21st, you know, if you ask me on June 21st, 2022, if I think the Reds are just going to finish off an 11 game win streak and be ahead of the Cardinals in the division, I think you're crazy, right. but here we are. And now the Reds are in a wide open division race. It's it's amazing to see, and I think that because of that division, and and you mentioned this, and I, I firmly expect this to be the case. The winner of the NL Central, it's like winner, it's a winner take all scenario, right? Because if you don't come in first in the NL Central, you ain't going to the playoffs. Yeah. This this division is bad, and I mean, you mentioned the West. There's uh, there's also you know you got three teams in the East that are probably going to be, you know, fighting for wild card spots when they don't win their division as well. The Reds are going to see the top team in the East this weekend in the Atlanta Braves. So, th so there's definitely a lot of um, focus on what the Reds can do. The Reds have a lot of opportunities in July against the Milwaukee Brewers, but it's, it's winning streaks like this. And looking back a couple of years ago, whenever the Reds were fighting for a playoff spot in 2021, it was a gargantuan winning streak that the Cardinals had to go on to make the playoffs that year. And it's things like that that can do it. Like if the Reds can extend the streak, maybe one or two more games or, you know, God forbid we talk about franchise history here. Like the Reds franchise record for winning streak is 14 uh, back in 18. That's half a month. Like when you put that in context, that's half a month of the season. That's a significant percentage exactly. of what you're looking and, and to kind of build off that. If the Rocky, for example, if you take the Rockies record and you add 11 wins to their total, the Rockies are in a wild card conversation right now. They are in the 40 win mark to get them in an NL wild card race right now. This win streak is massive. And, and part of what you had said, like there were so many opportunities for the Rockies in these games. Like, that's what's baffled me about this Reds team is that the pitching really hasn't taken the step forward, but it's just the hitting that they, they take care of any opportunity they seem to get in any game, whether it was this Rocky series, the Astros series, whether you're talking about back in uh, St. Louis or Kansas city, like it just felt like whatever the situation. And I know that you had the talking point the other day that uh, whoever hits the most homers in each game is going to win. Uh, the Rockies won the Homer race on the third day. And you mentioned Montero. I saw the prop <laughs> on FanDuel thought I was going to take that plus 1200 to Homer. And there he goes. He just uncorks one to left field and I much needed a B right there. That that's the swing we're looking for from Montero. That's the confidence. That's the player. The Rockies believe he can be is, is that guy. Cause that was a, I mean, that's just being able to be ready and jump on a pitch. I, I do love that. And I, that's the stuff that gets me excited about Montero because the Rockies lacking in power. People that don't follow the Rockies, I bet you you think the Rockies hit a bunch of home runs and do all this stuff. Right. But you look at the numbers, the Rockies are a bad offense team, uh, offensive team, and they get outscored and they are not they are not dominant at home either. Um, that is so crucial. And then the Reds, right. they get a big professional hitter as you're wearing the shirt who got away with an absolute crime in this final by the way an absolute <laughs> crime that's joey Votto getting a big time fat on the back because that pitch was completely in the zone and yeah. leaned into it and it led to the three runs it's lucky it was joey Votto because if the dodgers did that i would be fuming right now well, i still am fuming honestly because that was ridiculous right i had to watch the replay i know because i was I, I was watching it live from like the right field corner bar and i'm, I'm watching i'm like Hey, he's he's he didn't have three balls. Why why is he going? And then oh okay <laughs> yeah no that was a vet move. That was one of those that sure yeah. If I mean if that was a Rocky that did that, that, I'd be like what the heck? And <laughs> it, it, baseball is just these crazy plays every so often. Like I was really worried in the second game, um, and not to get too granular, but whenever you know Ellie De La Cruz slid in head first to third base and he got tagged by McMahon. 
I was really worried that that play was going to be so huge because of course, next guy up Spencer steer hits a long fly ball. That would have been the sack fly. And as the, as Alexis Diaz looked like a very gassed dude in that ninth inning and giving up a run, I'm like, Ooh, boy, that one run's going to be really crucial here. They could have been, could have been real nice, but just the way that this series unfolds, even in a series where you say, oh man, 11 games in a row, these reds are really rolling. Yeah. It's like one or two plays here or there could have totally swung everything. So that's why baseball is so beautiful. And that's why this winning streak for the reds is so beautiful. And I, I tell you this, Paul, there, there was a couple of guys, uh, on the Colorado side, one that's pretty obvious. The other is not so obvious that impressed me. And I got to get, I got to hear, I got to hear you wax poetic about Ellie De La Cruz one more time. We're going to do that coming up here in just a moment. Before we talk about that though, I want to tell you about the amazingness and we're going to wax poetic about bird dogs. Bird dogs are the most comfortable pair of shorts. I ever owned. got the chance to wear them to the ballpark today for the 11th straight win. Paul, and I'll tell you what, it was warm outside. I was standing for most of it because the big crowd there uh, for a Wednesday day game, but my bird dogs made me nice and comfy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they got the, they keep you nice and, uh, you know, they help with the sweat and it's an underappreciated yes. feature, Jeff zipper pockets. I preach oh, about yeah. the perfect zipper pockets because you're at the ballpark. Don't be worried about your ticket, your wallet, your phone zipper pocket takes great care of you and they fit great too. I have been known if you talk to Hannah about this ever so often, that things will just fall out of my pocket. Oh, so yeah. zipper pockets are absolutely massive. Plus these things look amazing too. And, and they're so versatile. You could go to the ballpark. You could go out on a date. You could take a swim. If you get the liner, uh, you could do all of this in your bird dogs. Check them out today. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB, and you'll get a free Yeti style tumbler with any purchase. Look at that beautiful tumbler there. If you're here on YouTube and if you're listening, it's, it's a beautiful Navy blue style Yeti style tumbler. You can go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. The Reds and the Rockies, you know, you can catch them on every single pitch of the hometown broadcast on Sirius XM. Just download the SXM app and search Reds or Rockies. I think the Rockies are off as well uh, today, aren't they? Uh, let me double check. They actually get an exciting series. Yeah, off today, but uh, they will see the Angels. No show hate, though. No show hate on oh. the bump, but uh, at least... Uh, matching up uh, what should be a, a fun series. I hope they see him again because I'd love to see Shohei uh, pitch. But, uh, yes, off today. And then Coors? Shohei? Um, Coors? No, it looks like it actually, yeah, it is. This is uh, this is Coors, uh, Shohei at Coors. Yep, because they are not in. Yep, and then it's uh, Freeland Anderson. And, oh, boy, as we saw in this one, the uh, finale, Austin Gomber on the bump. And what does he have a habit of doing? Giving up the long ball this season. I Again, it, it's I feel for Austin Gomber, man. I do because I think, as unfortunately as it is, he's forever tied to a really tough moment in Rockies history. Yeah. He's just, it's just, if you're talking performance, it just doesn't make, I don't get why the looping curveball at cores, a home run prone guy, the, the home runs given up by the, front, the, the pitching staff are, are so frustrating, especially when you add on that, that lack of power too. But uh, yeah, Shohei, Shohei at cores this weekend should be some fireworks for sure. Yeah, that was one I was thinking about him uh, as Joey Votto came back because it was kind of like the key moment for his return because he's uh, career wise. He just mashes Austin Gomber. I think Austin Gomber learned a lot from Adam Wainwright and uh, well, you know, Joey mashes Adam Wainwright too. So hopefully we get to see that. Joey mashes again. everybody, man. The dude comes in and hits just absolute moonshot tater. I, if Reds fans want to, you know, go in, I, I did talk about the significance of a guy like Joey Votto mm -hmm. coming back for a team like this. And it's incredibly important. It's incredibly important. He, he took the steps to come back fully healthy and ready to go. Yes. And he, an immediate impact. It, it wasn't, they're not weak ground balls that Joey Votto was hitting. Joey Votto was hitting a hundred miles an hour off the bat and leaning very well far into the zone and being a total cheater. So, yes. you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, he, he, that veteran presence is so important. And I think it's so important for a guy like Jonathan India to be able to continue to learn from a guy like that, because that's who I see as a future leader of the, of the, of the reds. He just gives me yeah. too low vibes. 
He gives me kind of Trevor Story vibes where likes to be, you know, flashy on the field because he's confident in his play and backs it up a little bit. And, uh, and of course, I, I, I didn't realize the Reds had the most exciting thing in baseball because Ellie De La Cruz is fascinating. I mean, that guy, it's crazy that baseball is seeing these players that are so unique. I mean, Shohei Otani is once in a lifetime thing. But Ellie De La Cruz, I mean, I swear that guy's going to get so many more infield singles than anybody in the history of the game. I mean, I mean, it, it, and based, I mean, another thing to kind of go back, I know we're talking about impressive, but I was impressed by him. I mean, and, and yeah. I'm just impressed by the Reds willingness to play the new ball. I talk about this on my podcast all the time. It's a new generation of baseball and the Rockies don't play it. They don't steal bases. They're not fast. They're not aggressive. That's the complete opposite. I mean, you're right. not going to shut down ellie because he got punked on that double play ball today i mean that was just a good baseball play but you're going to trust your guy to do it and that's what makes those things so dangerous when you can when you can create the threat of an immediate scoring position via the stolen base it's such a slam dunk and something especially for teams like the reds and the uh, the reds and the rockies that don't hit a lot of home runs that's those are the moments you generate your offense right there in two hitter friendly ballparks yes you're going to get the dub maybe you're not leaving the yard but you'll get the double in the gap or you'll get the bloop. That's going to be enough to get you in there. I mean, I was just impressed by the fact that the Reds were able to handle adversity a few times as a young team. But I, I really do think the most impressive Red out of this series was Joey Votto. It, he literally looked like he didn't miss a beat. Uh, I mean, on top and and De La Cruz and and Ellie as well, just because it, that's that's a young guy you look at and you say, "Holy smokes." That guy's got it's like when yeah. I because I was in uh being in Seattle, that's where I'm technically based. I watched a lot of Julio last year. Oh, yeah, and it's like that's the guy. Like he, he's he starts, he's gonna play. That's it, it's time. And right. that's what I got from 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 him as well. So the Reds are really, really fun and exciting. I, I I do that pitching staff, though, especially the bullpen, seems to be the, the biggest weak weakness for that team that I saw. It's it's interesting because the bullpen's been the thing that's kind of held it all together at this point. The starting pitching staff has been very rough. Um, Andrew Abbott has been a revelation ever since his call up, and he did get roughed up a little bit there, but he was able to limit the damage at least to solo shots. Um, I, I said it at the time, whenever Ellie hit into that double play, and before I forget this, I want to say this, but whenever Ellie hit into the double play, I said, that's one of the few times anybody's going to get him. Because you got to, I mean, as a, as a fielding team, as an opposing team for Ellie De La Cruz, you got to hope the ball's hit right at you and hit hard and you're close to the second base bag so you can flip and go because he is just so fast down that line. I mean, you saw it on Tuesday night whenever he hit off the pitcher, and I forget who the relief pitcher was, but it just hit off of him and he was going to be safe at first, even if the a throw mile. Was there. it wasn't a close play. Yeah. And then he, he, you know, air mailed it in right field. And so then Ellie's on second. That's just what he does. And you add in the fact that every so often he's going to uncork a 118 mile an hour zinger for like 500 feet. And it's, it's amazing to see what he can do. Uh, kind of watching the other side of the ball there for the Rockies. Two guys really stood out. And the guy that really obviously stood out for the Rockies for me was Nolan Jones. I mean, just an amazing series. The Reds had a very hard time getting him out. Um, the What was it? Was it, I think it was Monday? Was he three for three or four for four with like a walk or something? It was. Let me see. It was something like that. But yeah, uh, Nolan Jones has been super exciting. Uh, comes over to the Rockies in a trade uh, after a trade uh, this year. It was one of the few moves the Rockies did make. They they do uh, get him from the Guardians, and if he can do what he does, that he's fitting a great course field, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. spot there. Corner outfields. He can also play uh, corner bags as well. He, he can play first base. He can play in the outfield. Great utility use there. And if he can hit the ball hard and far like he did. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, he uh, against the Reds. Let's see. It was uh, the second game of the series. Game two of the series, four for four, two RBI, a walk, a home run, and a stolen base. That's what the Rockies need. I mean, that is what the Rockies desperately need is, is solid performance like that. That's dominant offense. That's good offense. And it's great to see it from one of the young guys. And a guy that, you know, another thing where the Rockies are kind of frustrating, where it's like, why are we playing? There's just some guys where you have question marks where it's like, how did those guys, these veterans, or those picks help us for the future? Because, you know, most likely this team is going to, you know, 
these vets ain't going to be around here forever. How much do we really want to see your Mike Moustakas's, your Randall Gritchicks? And, and both of them are having fine seasons on top of that. But there's just so many missed opportunities now for the Rockies. And when you talk about someone like Nolan Jones, it's the Chris Bryant contract complicates that even further because right. he plays a position that Nolan Jones can play. And when do you start having those conversations? Because Chris Bryant still owed a lot of money and still is going to be a Rocky for, for a long, long time. So uh, I'm really loving what I'm seeing. Big whiff rate though, you know, swing and miss mm -hmm. a lot, and miss the ball. But hey, you know what? If you're, if you have a Trevor story season where you launch a bunch of nukes and you strike out a bunch of times and you can lower those strikeout numbers and take that type of trajectory, I'll be happy with that too. This, the, the Rockies, as a, he's not the only one. The Rockies, as a whole, have a strikeout problem, as we saw today. I think uh, the starter there in the, for the Reds gave up the three bombs, but also, I think, end of the day with double-digit strikeouts. Yeah, Abbott was Abbott was dealing. That was something that I want to see a lot more of, of him, uh, a lot more from him, because his first three starts, he didn't have that many strikeouts, but that was his profile in, in the minor leagues. Um, but yeah, Nolan Jones really stood out. And then one other dude, and, and I looked at his numbers today and they were just absolutely crazy. And that's Jorge Alfaro. Like how you bat a buck 58, but you slug four twenty. like <laughs> well, he's, been just... on, not, he's been on the Rockies for all that long. I mean, this is like, I think the first like week he's been up on the team. I'm sure you really, you realized, holy cow, he's on the team, which is great. And a uh, big moment there, a couple of big, uh, yeah. shots off the wall and of course the three run home run to make things real interesting there in game number Big two shot that one was yeah. um but it's it's a question of why are the rockies carrying three catchers <laughs> that's the same and, question and their their best offensive player has been elias diaz their catcher right so now are you going to, as you saw I, it was it's crazy. I can't there has to be I mean obviously with the new rules when was the last time the Rockies rolled out two catchers in their lineup is probably never uh okay. when it comes down to it because the catching position has often not been one of greatness other than Diaz I would say Elias Diaz is Elias yeah, Diaz might go good. down as the best catcher in Rockies history potentially you can or at least one of them. Too. Uh, there hasn't steel. been there's a couple of them but like I don't want to see Jorge Alfaro bat over Montero. Like, I don't like as right. much as these, like, I get it. Like, Hey, Alfaro still got some pop in his bat. Then why is Austin wins on the team? Like, what, what are we doing <laughs> there? Like, I, I, it's, it's just one of those moves where it's like, great, but is he going to be great for two weeks? And then he's just going to take at bats from young guys because the, it's a team. It's 29 and 40, whatever. I mean, this is a team losing eight games in a row. Like, do I need to watch Jorge Alfaro take bats at bats for this team? Uh, I, no, but I mean, I do like home runs and, and ball and extra base hits. So I, I will definitely take it. It's just one of those kind of head scratchers where it's just like, why? I, I just, I really don't get it. It just goes back to show that there's so many similarities between these two teams. And I'll tell you why coming up next. <clears throat> Sorry. Before we get to that, wanted to let you know, you can listen to Reds and Rockies hometown broadcast on Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just download uh, the app and search the word Reds or search the word Rockies. And also, uh, always thanks for making Locked on Rockies and Locked on Reds your first listen every single day. And if you are an everydayer, let us know down in the comment section. We always appreciate to hear from our everydayers. Um, Paul, it's funny because we we did a podcast last year where we said that the similarities of the Rockies and the Reds are far more than I think people realize. And, and, and while the Reds have enjoyed a lot more success this season than they thought they would, you mentioned something that is completely like mirror image, two Spider-Men pointing at each, <laughs> at each other. The Reds need to get rid of their three catcher plan too, <laughs> because they Why opened we, up the season. What is this plan? Who decided I, this? When is this ever? But like, is this the new the money ball? Catching. Like, no, it's not. By the way, it's not. It's. It, I think it's like teams thinking it is, but they, they started the season and they're just like, we're going to take pressure off of Tyler Stevenson by having three catchers, and then he can play first base and he can play DH. Well, he played first base six times, and the last time he did it was April 27th. And then he's not really hitting super well, which I'm not. I, and I think it's interesting because there's a lot of people that are like, man, I'm super worried about seeing. I'm not. I think he's going to figure it out sooner rather than later, especially when he gets a little bit more, you know, catching 
appearances. But as you mentioned, you guys have a young catcher that you want to see play. You guys have a good catcher and Elias Diaz that you want to see play. And the Reds are the same way. They have a young catcher in Luke Maley who's played pretty well. And then you have Tyler Stevenson that you want to see catch. In all due respect to Kirk Casale, because he's fielded his position very well this season. And, you know, lots of people want to quote the catcher ERA stat to me. I don't necessarily put a whole lot of a whole lot of um uh, cache into that. But the biggest thing for me is who would you rather have on the roster? Kirk Casale or Christian Encarnacion strand. And I don't know that there's anyone in this world that wants to see Kirk Casale over Christian Encarnacion strand. So when you said the Rockies need to get rid of their three catcher plan, I'm like, dude, moving forward, that's gotta be the next thing the reds do. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's not just that it's, it's, it's a complete reevaluation of every single position that you have, because the, yeah. it, all of the weaknesses of the Rockies are on full display in 2023, massive injuries to your pitching staff exposes the lack of depth at the starting pitching position leading to the Rockies bullpen ha- was actually to start the season. And in may one of the better ones and one of uh, technically the best in baseball, but when you overwork and you don't have starters that can't go past the third, the fourth, The fifth, you're going to look and then look what happened today. I mean, a bullpen day was actually working out pretty well for the Rockies up until uh, later on, which has just kind of been par for the course. If you're the Rockies, when you're looking at what's next, hopefully you're reevaluating everything. I personally think every single person should be considered tradable at this point. There's no real true foundation direction outside of a handful of players. I think Ezekiel Tovar, who we didn't see in this series because he became a father over the weekend on Father's Day is exciting and legit he is awesome and he is fun he's he is developing more and more into a major league ball player Uh, and some of these other young guys deserve their chance consistently at the major league level what did what happened when the rockies played brendan Rodgers all the time oh snap it turns out he can play gold glove caliber defense and he's a great offensive threat i want to see all these guys in the lineup so i don't necessarily know what you can get but there's no real point for the Rockies to continue on with CJ Crone, Yurikson Profar, Mike Moustakis, Jorge Alfaro, Austin Wins, even Elias Diaz and Ryan McMahon. Everyone should be tradable. You're going to tell me that a team like Seattle or a team like Miami wouldn't want Elias Diaz or Ryan McMahon to come and play their team? They got great pitching farm systems. You don't have to worry about it. Guess they're signing them because guess what? They got traded. They got to come to Colorado. You got to get them to come here. And there's pitchers here that have accepted and taken on the challenge of pitching here. The Rockies need to change the mindset, the culture, and everything surrounding this team and the roster itself. There's a lot that the Rockies need to do what's next. And I don't necessarily know when they're going to figure it out because I'm not sitting here confident that this – people are saying they're going to sell. Heard that every year. If if you ain't going to trade Trevor Story and John Gray – I don't think you're going to trade, you know, and, and what could you, what can you really get for um, hurt for most of the season? CJ Crone, who's been down since the all-star game of last year, a, a jerks and profile who is still hitting underneath uh, under league average by advanced statistics and metrics and veteran Mike Moustakis. And, and really it is. If you're, if the Rockies are going to make changes, they have to do what the Reds did and they're going to have to trade fan favorites. People say this all the time and I will squash this. Charlie Blackman ain't going anywhere. I really, uh, Charlie Blackman's hurt, broke his hand as well this year, a long injury. Uh, It's much more likely in my eyes that Charlie, if Charlie Blackman plays in another uniform, I'll be shocked. I just don't, I think the Rockies, that number is going to be take, be taken off Charlie Blackman and ain't going to be worn by anybody else. Uh, he has been Mr. Rocky for, for a long, long time and has especially been the face uh, of the franchise in the, in the post Arenado world. So when, when you, when you look for what's next for the Rockies, you're hopeful that they're looking to reevaluate everything. I, I just don't have any confidence that they actually will. It'll be interesting because I know that I, I've looked a lot at, you know, Daniel Bard and, and what the Reds maybe could send to the Rockies. See, even he's, he's not the same guy this year. I mean, the, yeah. the Rockies, here's the deal. With these veterans that aren't MVPs and generational third base talents or, you know, shortstops that hit 30, 40 bombs a year or and things of that nature, they're not that valuable. The Rockies veterans at this point aren't valuable. Guess who was really valuable to deadline last year? CJ Crone and Daniel Bard. Daniel Bard's, you know, been dealing with the, uh, you know, the mental stuff again, which I really actually appreciate his openness in the Rockies approach there. But these guys aren't the same players. And you could have gotten a, a, 
a, a third starter. Uh, you could have mm-hmm. gotten a bullpen piece. You could have gotten – you can't fix your pitching without making the trades. And the Reds, uh, you know, I know you miss with, m- watching Luis Castillo pitch, but I know you feel better about the Reds right now than you did when he was struggling on that team that was, tw- you know, struggling to toil to be in relevancy. Yep. No, I, I am 100% there. And and even when they made the trade of Castillo, I absolutely understood it. And there were guys that I was looking for. And Marte was right there at the top of the list. So I was happy to see that the Reds, you know, were able to make that trade at the time. And and even looking now, I, I, I have confidence that Nick Crawl will make the moves that he needs to make. I think that we have seen over the last year, and this is the biggest difference. We talk about the similarities between our two teams the biggest difference between our two teams is I feel like for all of the dumb things that Phil Castellini, who is the son of owner Bob Castellini for all the uh, dumb things that he has said, the smartest thing that both he and Bob have done is take their hands off the wheel and let the front office cook. Nick crawl has been operating. I don't necessarily know that it's independently, but he has been operating as the man in control of the situation for the last few years. I firmly believe that there was plenty of reports that back in the past, like, you know, you go back to when the Reds had Billy Hamilton and there was an opportunity for Dick Williams to trade Billy Hamilton for some real prospects. And Bob said, no, because Bob said, well, he's a fan favorite. Can't get rid of fan favorites. Can't do that. And then he finally took his hands off the wheel, let Nick crawl, do his thing. And here we are. I told everybody and Steve and I have both talked about this many times on the podcast. We told everybody this was not going to take that long for this rebuild because they let the front office do what they do. And we are seeing the fruits of that. So I firmly believe and and Nick crawl said the other day to the, to the media that there's nothing currently on the horizon, but he's, he's looking to make the team better in any way that he possibly can. And I firmly believe that they could go out and get another starter and they're, or they're going to go out and get another fresh uh, bullpen arm, whether that be our oldest Chapman or, or whoever it is like different things like that, because they have the prospect capital to deal with. And I don't think they're going to deal from the top of it. It's probably going to be in the middle because this farm system is so deep because of all of the talent they've accumulated over the last few years, but they're going to be able to make smart trades because they're not just going to pay whatever price is out there. They're going to find the deal that suits them best because Nick crawl is smart enough to find that. And I feel like that has been the biggest factor in how the reds have turned this around so quickly is when you let the baseball people, baseball, you find teams like the guardians, the rays, the giants who are just fantastically ran because their owner knows the people in the front office can handle it. Yep. And you know, it's the exact opposite. Dick Momfort hires from within bill Schmidt was a long time Rockies member pro- promoted from within it's promote within it's Dick and his buddies. I mean, it, it, and that is, that is the name of the game. And uh, you know, I, I, I do hope that if the Rockies, there is one big last my last thing for big picture that I, I think could change for the, the the outlook of the Rockies is the shadow just got bigger. The Rockies are now the only big four major men's team in Denver to not have a championship and to not have what looks to be the opportunity to get there. The Broncos make the move, you know, they're they spend the money. They got the championship. Even if it, it failed, they went out and made one of the biggest trades to get one of the biggest free, you know, you know, trade quarterbacks. Massive move. Denver Nuggets, back-to-back MVP, first championship, Avalanche, Stanley Cup champion. The shadow grows larger. But on the flip side, 30K a plus a year in the summer, still go to Coors Field. So it's it, – it, people tell me, you know, and we see it all the time, and I have to hammer it home, Dick Momford ain't selling the Rockies anytime soon. That is a cash cow, and, hey, they keep losing. They don't, they, they don't deal with 2,000 people showing up to the ballpark. It's prime time now. It's school's out. Course field's yeah. gonna be packed. Well, I tell you what, we this the, these two teams. It's going to be interesting to watch how they continue to develop because I think you're right. I think that the Rockies have to do what they have to do, and they have to accumulate young talent. We'll see if they can do that, and we'll see if the Reds can get the uh, guys that they need moving forward uh big test this weekend on both sides with Shohei coming to Coors and you got the Braves coming to Great American Ballpark 
you're not going to want to miss Lockdown Reds and Lockdown Rockies as we have you covered every single day for your favorite team. Before we get out of here, remember that you can always catch the hometown broadcast of the Reds and the Rockies on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search the word Reds or search the word Rockies.